Lakshmi Holstrom's English translation of a novel, The Hour Past Midnight, was shortlisted for the Crossword Book Prize and longlisted for the Man Asian Prize DSC Award. Um, forthcoming books include Maname Uncle? Is that how it's said? Maname Uncle and Sabam. Would you like to read from the podium? Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to read one poem in Tamil, then add some English poems. Oppandam. ஒவ்வொரு முறையும் அம்மா நாசுக்காய் சொல்வதை அக்கா கோபமாய் சொல்வாள் படுக்கை அறையின் தவறுகள் எல்லாம் என்னுடையதென தினமும் படுக்கை அறையில் எதிர்கொள்ளும் முதல் பேச்சு இன்றைக்கு என்ன அநேகமாக இறுதி பேச்சும் இதுவாகவே இருக்கும் வேசைத்தனத்தினை சுட்டும் விரல் ஒளிரும் கோடி நட்சத்திரங்களில் இருந்து நீள நடுங்கும் இரவுகளில் மிதக்கும் அறிவுரைகள் குட்டிக்கு உணவூட்ட இயலா பூனையின் தேம்பி அழும் குழந்தை குரல் கவ்வி பிடிக்கிறது ஈரலை உனக்கும் கூட புகார்கள் இருக்கலாம் என் நிலைப்பாடு காலத்தாலும் வரலாற்றாலும் தெளிவாக்கப்பட்டிருக்கிறது உன்னிடமிருந்து களங்களானதே எனினும் சிறிது அன்பை பெற உனது குழந்தையின் தாய் என்னும் பொறுப்பை நிறைவேற்ற வெளியுலகில் இருந்து சானிடரி நாப்கின்களையும் கருத்தடை சாதனங்களையும் பெற இன்னும் சிறு சிறு உதவிகள் வேண்டி முடியுமானால் உன்னை சிறிதளவு அதிகாரம் செய்ய நான் சிறிதளவு அதிகாரத்தை ஸ்திரப்படுத்தி கொள்ள எல்லா அறிதல்களுடனும் விரிகிறது என் யோனி எல்லா அறிதல்களுடனும் விரிகிறது என் யோனி த கான்ட்ராக்ட் ஆல்வேஸ் மை சிஸ்டர் வில் ரிப்பீட் இன் ஆங்கர் வாட் அம்மா சேஸ் மோர் சர்ட்லி தட் I am to blame for all that goes wrong in the bedroom. Every day in the bedroom, these are the first words to greet me. So, what is it today? Often, they are the last words to. From a thousand simmering stars, pointing fingers, accuse me of whoredom of once again, and counsels float into the trembling night the child like soaping up a cat unable to feed its litter seizes me by the entrails you too may have your complaints but time and our history make very clear where i now stand to receive a little love however tarnished from you to fulfill my responsibility as your child's mother to buy from the outside world my sanitary napkins and contraceptives and for many other little favors to hold a little authority over you if possible to strengthen what authority i have just a little in full knowledge of all this my vagina opens thank you next poem um, this is uh, about uh, marwana thank you marwana didn't know this myself until by smoking marwana i'd entered into it from my body hewed from a man's rib a wing hatch without me even knowing it in the throat swords with their sharpness sunk in the source saturated taste of that wine my body's an eagle midnight's pole of darkness risking total nakedness can now be thrown with a few kisses i'll put down the weight of demons crouch in the brain it's not the way somebody said it would be this my body made keen 
as the earth stained restless dispersing clouds are made keen do, do this night as if for the first time inviting with me the body i hadn't been aware of i arrived to the mavana that made this possible thank you one more poem a small poem tonight tonight the growing smell of blood on the knife fallen on my fingers searches out the stench of tedious 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 sex hiding by the lands of my memories perspective i stand upside down and comb my hair i cook top seat heavy and eat this too i squat inverted to feed my child heels upward i read my books upside down i gaze my at myself terrified stunned and staring at me a pet hanging ripe on the tree in the garden one poem is uh, in hindi uh, new poem can you read it please thank you very much uh so i'm having a fan moment right now because uh, around one year ago my mother gifted me salma's book called wild words and i've been reading it since the past one year and i've been deeply inspired by her thoughts on uh, uh you know gender based issues so uh yeah i'm really privileged to read this piece it's called meri hindi bahut kharab hai waise main pad nahi pata acche se to agar kuch galat pronounce kar dunga to maaf kar dena taaliyon se usko compensate kar dena is kavita ka naam hai sharir ko bolne do mere sharir par vishwas karo ise tumse baat karne do इसे मेरी चेतना को तुम्हारे कानों तक बेबाक पहुंचने दो इसे बोलने दो इसे ऐलान करने दो इसे बताने दो उन संघर्ष उन जंग के बारे में जो इसने घर की चार दीवारी में कैद रहकर कराहत हुए विकसित हो रहे स्तनों के साथ लड़ा है इसे झकते हुए इजहार करने दो कमोड के सफ़ेद तख्त पर गिरी पहली रेशमी लाल बूंद के बेचैन कर देने वाले दर्द का जिसे इसने पुराने कपड़ों में सोखा है इसे गुनगुनाने दो सदियों में सदियों से संजो रखे सोखियों अदाओं और श्रृंगार में गीतों को इसे साज लगाने दो दबे कामनाओं और मोहब्बतों के उद्गाम का इसे शब्दों में बयां करने दो अजीब से बिस्तर पर किसी अनजान की गसना को बुझाने को मजबूरी का सदमा इसे बताने दो शिशु जन्म गर्भपात अनगिनत बदबूदार रिसाव मेनोपॉज के बाद की वो सूजन भरी घुटनों की आह के बारे में इसे अपनी आवाज को बुलंद कर कर खुद अजागार करने दो तुम ना समझ लोग समझ लो जिसका तुम बलात्कार करते हो वो शरीर नहीं बल्कि एक घाटक शास्त्र है इसमें प्रकृति और पलाय दोनों समाये हैं शरीर को बोलने दो थैंक यू सो मच सलमा एंड सिमल फॉर हेल्पिंग आउट विद पोएम आई नाउ इंट्रोड्यूस सिमल हुज वेरी स्टैंडिंग अप सिमल सिंह इज अ स्पोकन वर्ड पोएट फ्रॉम मुंबई ही हैज फाउंडेड अन एरेज पोएट्री अ कम्युनिटी टू प्रमोट स्पोकन वर्ड पोएट्री थ्रू डिजिटल कॉन्टेंट He uses poetry to narrate stories he he lives through and witnesses which compel thought and change. Simmer. Thank you. Uh so there's one small thing that we do in spoken word. How many of you have ever attended a spoken word event? Do you know what we do? We snap, right? So can I have everyone in the audience snap with both their hands? Keep it going. It's really cold so it'll make you feel warm as well. And every time you like a line just keep snapping. It'll help you stay warm. It'll help me perform better. Uh how many of you are still in school or college uh, still studying 
how many of you think our education system is not the best in the world? Okay, so this piece is called Blackboards. The blackboard in front of the desk, 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 in front of me screams. But nobody can hear it. Its echoes only reach the last benches of the class where I sit. My ears hurt after a minute. I stand up and yell, stop! Everybody in front of me turns as if I had stolen all their tiffin boxes just an hour before break and I was caught. The teacher stops writing mid-sentence, her chalk breaks, falls, the blackboard stops screaming. It is tough to be a 17-year-old with the dreams and goals because blackboards have written down for me rules I must follow. After 12 years of school, I hate blackboards. I hate blackboards to the point I may set them to fire as if they were exam papers that went too bad, as if it were my heart, beating in a body no longer alive. It is tough to be a 17-year-old who's written poems on exam papers that were the least poetic, who's been asked to focus on his academics, who's been sent to counselors but for his career and not for his relationships. I no longer feel like going to school. Blackboards make fun of me. They call me all sorts of names. They tell me that my grades aren't good enough, that I'm wearing the wrong socks today, that my future, my future will be determined by a set of numbers they give me, that my report card means more than my art, that I'm living in a bubble. But how do I tell them that this body, this body is the bubble. If you touch it too hard, it may burst and scream. It is tough to be a 17-year-old who wants to follow his passion because they tell me that my passion is my talent and my talent is a hobby and hobbies are meant for leisure and not for careers. But if hobbies were meant to be pursued, then what I conclude is that all artists are screwed and the Beatles were wrong when they told Jude that he could fix everything and make all bad songs happy because they said that I could be anything. But they never let me. It's the last day of school today. I will no longer be seeing blackboards ever again, I hope. I smile at the blackboard in my classroom as it starts screaming, but nobody hears it. Its echoes only reach the last benches of the class where I have been sitting for centuries now, writing on desks, painting on walls, singing at the windows, smiling at grown-ups who don't understand me, failing at exams that I was never meant to write, but then the bell rings, the blackboard stops screaming, and everybody in my classroom leaves, but I stay. I stay and I write down all of my poems on these blackboards before I leave. I teach them concepts that were never written on their sacred bodies. I then pick up blackboards from every single classroom in in my school and place them in the school corridors. Imagine a dozen blackboards stacked up, riled up together in school corridors, standing disoriented, confused for the first time in their life. Blackboards will understand how it feels to be in a place where you don't belong. Thank you. Uh, that was a very angsty piece. I'm going to change the mood a bit. This is the last piece of the session, just one more piece. Uh, I'll need a small favor from you guys. This is a piece which I do with the audience. Uh, it's a piece that came out of a dream and imagination, and then I sort of wrote it in a dream as well and then penned it down when I woke up. So it's a very interesting piece. So I like to perform it as if everyone in the audience is dreaming. So what I would want you to do is to shut your eyes, completely shut your eyes, and focus on the center of your forehead. And you will see a lot of colors, but try to see white. Try to see as much white as you can by focusing on the center of your forehead. And let this piece take you wherever it does. Everyone in the audience, even you guys can shut your eyes if you want to. This piece is called Falling. One moment, you're driving at 120 on the highway. 
getting through an empty road. The next, you've driven your entire family off a bridge. You slowly shut your eyes as you push the accelerator harder. You take up your hands from the steering wheel because you've been staring at this wheel and caring for real while you feel that the sun was probably too much today. And it may not be the best day to drive. The car is in midair between the river whose name will soon be forgotten and the bridge that speed dialed your way to your own death. When you turn back one last time to look into the faces of your loved ones, they don't smile like they used to. It's not the fall that's coming then that scares you, but the hopeless faces that have already felt the trauma. Your mind goes back in time. It rewinds to how this happened. It reminds you of your first ever breakup. You were running in a park full of strangers with your favorite breakup band playing in on your earphones, filling in voids in you that you'd never known existed. You start running fast. Your heart starts beating as fast as it did the day that you met her, so you shut your eyes and visualize her face. You don't need to move your legs anymore. They run on their own. And just when you start to feel the wind hit your face, you hit something. You're falling. You're in midair between the track that was unfaithful to you and the ground that has been waiting just for you to fall. When you open your eyes, you will find yourself in a car full of your loved ones that is in mid-air, falling, 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 falling. Thank you. Thank you, that was amazing. I'm reminded uh, of something William Gibson said when he was describing cyberspace, a concept um, he invented before it came into existence. And he called it a simultaneous consensual hallucination. And uh, Simmel's last poem made me feel that way. And to some extent, that's what all poetry does. I mean, it's supposed to create with the bare skeleton of a set of words on pages the ability in people to feel approximately the same way where you are supplying so much more of the information. Uh, I'd like to thank at the end of this, our last Poetry Hour session, uh, everybody who was here, and I'm seeing a lot of faces who've been here throughout all the sessions this week. Um, we'd like to thank JLF for, for being such a fantastic platform for poetry across languages. We've heard four languages here tonight. Um, Poetry across languages has so many common elements, so many features which we, we should celebrate, the musicality, the storytelling, uh, the, the individual voices we've been hearing. And um, last but not least, uh, just to close this out, if you've enjoyed what you, what you heard tonight, if you've enjoyed what you've been hearing for the last couple of nights, I'd like to request everyone to go buy some of uh, the books by poets you've been listening to, because equally as much as people need poetry, Poetry needs people. Thank you. Thank you so much to our wonderful poets. And thank you, Satyajit, for hosting this every night. It's been just the most amazing hour. It's a great way to end every. Pity we don't have one tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all uh, so much. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow at Samvat. And, uh, um, and um, have a great night.
uh, poets who are uh, just coming off of other sessions. So we'll bring them on stage as soon as they arrive. Um, in the meantime, I want to introduce, uh, uh, well, I want to introduce all of them. Um, Anita Heiss, Jagdish Giri, Mohammed Hassan, Salma Sirmar Singh, and Sukrita Paul Kumar, moderated by Satyajit Sarna. Satyajit Sarna is a writer and poet from New Delhi. He's the author of The Angel's Shore, a coming-of-age novel, and The Profane, a collection of poetry. Please welcome to the stage our panelists. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to day four of Poetry Hour at ZJLF 2019. Um, it's sort of that fourth day of the festival where I think we've all forgotten what it's like to live life before the festival. And uh, I don't know what we'll do when it's over, which will unfortunately be shortly. Uh, this is the last Poetry Hour. And usually we have, uh, we have multilingual international uh, sort of poets for you and a set of readings um, from around the world, hopefully something for everyone's taste. We also have a scheduled intermission for music from that side and one shutter which closes from that side. So I've warned you in advance, don't feel disturbed. Um, so we're waiting for a couple of poets to join us um, and w as and when they come on, sort of we'll ask them to read. Um, uh, every day I like to think of a sort of suggestion for the audience as a way of connecting the poets who are on stage with us. Uh, so we've been through musicality, uh, sense of place, uh, poetic voice. And today I think uh, I'd like us to possibly look at these poets through the lens of narrative storytelling. And I think we have the right set of poets for that. Uh, may I first invite Mohammed Hassan. Mohammed Hassan is a Fulbright scholar and a British Council Fellow. He studied human geography at the University of Jodhpur and Syracuse and management at, Man at Manchester University. He has taught at Jodhpur University and Nairobi University and at the HCM Rajasthan State Institute of Public Administration. His writings include the recent book of poetry, Sediments of Silence. He is a peace rights activist who writes on the environment and community issues and organizes relief operations for disaster victims. Mr. Mohammed Hassan, yeah. Uh, I'm very grateful to JLF organizers and to Satyajit and to my colleagues that I got an opportunity of life to speak my poetry. Uh, this is a 25 years of work. They came in five colors. I brought only two colors, the peace and the rebellion. Uh, this is what I am and I stand for. I'm a sort of peace activist and uh, you can call it autobiography of my book, myself, and uh, it speaks about my concern and your concern and what is to be concerned about. Uh, first poem, this volume's introduction. I wrote in words, you can say my journey or my autobiography clothed in certain idioms, certain imageries, which I have taken from wherever I had gone there. 
It wasn't an easy universe. It was a bleak desert for a childhood to grapple with, while their feet were dug in coarse sand and shirt poked by thorns, eyes were fixed on landscapes of moonlit skies. The home wasn't on a sea beach, nor on a promontory overlooking a blue stream. There wasn't any paved road, piped water, or electricity. Our wells were deep, their waters barely sweet. Their depth echoed grief of wandering spirits. We were not a large landowning family. Grandfather was not a bureaucrat, or father a judge, and mother a professor, brother a banker, or sister a famed dancer. There wasn't any firm hand to help draw a straight line on sand, slate, or paper. Poetry wasn't the staple food, neither in the family nor in the neighborhood. Barefoot, without books, we walked to schools, the only school, kicking dust, talking loud, and laughing. It was on a desert street in a small town without school bus or security. Children who go to school these days may compare these lives of yesterday. Grains and vegetables came occasionally when it was a good rainy season. Millet porridge in skimmed goat milk was daily routine. Camel milk pudding was an occasional feat. Faced charcoal baked wheat bread with butter and jaggery was a treat. Tomatoes, cauliflower, capsicum, okra, French beans were unheard things. Whatever we ate or cooked was no doubt authentic and wholesome thing. Never heard of Valentine's Day cakes and Christmas tree. The Mojin and Mahant lived with ease in each other's skin. The Ajahn and the temple gong blended together upward in eternity. Escaping canning in most madrasa, I landed on a government school's cold lime floor. Neither alphabets nor numbers came easy. English was difficult to please. Canning caused cramming and school window jumping. Love helped learning, teachers, teacher taught lifelong bonding. Paid tuition by teachers was a sin. Illiterate mother, a busy bee, tending household, did not know what and how I was learning. She just believed in God's hands rest everything. She just wished I follow Sirat al Mustaqim, the straight path. Find your own way as you wish, as birds tell their hatchling, was the ethos of every street. Percentage of marks were not part of the community lingo. Preference of subject was not an issue. Each one required thorough learning, and learning meant becoming. Planning by parents for children. Educational trajectory was alien. Neighborhood teachers shepherded us with love and zeal, whatever their teaching skills. That mathematics was not compulsory in college and college was thrilling and liberating. Upward steps became easy. Scholarships lubricated geographical mobility. The slopes were steep. Climbing demanded an ant-like grip. Mobility gave opportunities for long journeys and many warms bonding from landscapes traversed and observed, people met, world seen and discussed and friendship cultivated have oozed these free verse feelings hovering around the world of poetry. These are like those shy young Amish girls from a hamlet in a corn belt First time at the busy O'Hare airport, showing their boarding slips, timorously asking for the gate number from where their flights could be. Thank you. Now, this is something I'm worried about, and you must be worried about also, 
that the earth is on edge. And why it is on edge? Because of our actions and our thinking. The <coughs> poem is Incubator. <coughs> it never happened that all sand dunes were flattened by camels. I'm contrasting what today we blame to for something going wrong and what is actually the situation as I believe. It never happened that all sand dunes were flattened by camels, that all forests were destroyed by herds and fires, that all hills were dug by reptiles and insects, that all black bucks were killed by lions and panthers, that all huts and hearths were cursed by earthquake, that all farms and grass fields were washed away by floods, that all women were raped by strangers. Yes, it never happened that cattle and beasts drank all our waters, that all fish were eaten by fishermen, that all fruits were finished by birds and tribal children, that all gypsies were killed by snake bites and scorpion stings, that the nomads' music annoyed and defend us. It happens though that the trader becomes judge and barber banker, the porter becomes professor, tea vendor minister, that butcher becomes bureaucrat, and that tribal becomes bonded slave and beggar. It never happened that an untouchable entered a temple unhindered, that a woman became priest, temple priest, and keeper, that niqab and burqa were perceived as forehead stains, that husband observed fast for life, for wife's life and health, that a widower, that a widower climbed his wife's pyre to keep the sacred bow, bow knotted together in life and death. Can it happen that someday, as many a tears hope, an innocent walking to the gallows forever takes away with him the grisly nose to the bottomless pit. Alas, but it may happen. Alas, it may, but it may happen that hills and huts, flora and fauna, sleep, love and peace are at the mercy of the monster incubating in us, itching to blow up the earth. Gaza. As a peace activist, you all love peace, but sometimes you are victim of sloganeering and other things. I'm describing in my two poems, Aleppo and Gaza, but I'll read one. Gaza, blood smeared, limbs severed, eyes blank and lips pursed, parched, homeless, wasted motherhood sits on a tiny grave. She still hopes the baby will suck her breast. Where playful girls cried, ran for life and died, where homes became graves and graves became homes, where young mothers wept, crippled fathers begged, what can bomb do? What can the insane do in vain rage? When out to revenge or change, have a heart, Visit Gaza. How kings dined well, washed death, kept quiet, and slept well. Ask those who swear by Allah, living in around Kaaba, not far from Gaza. What are death? What are deaths and destruction? What are madness and murders? What is shame? What is the ultimate game? What is the world? What is its promise played again and again in the theater of Gaza? Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. I'd like to move to our second poet. Um, Dr. Anita Heiss is the, an award-winning author of fiction and nonfiction. Her two poetry collections include Token Kuri and the wonderfully titled I'm Not Racist But. The focus of her work is Aboriginal literature and life. She's a lifetime ambassador of the Indigenous Literary Foundation 
and a proud member of the Virat Jodhi Nation of New South Wales. She's also Professor of Communications at the University of Queensland. She has said she would prefer not to be thought of as a poet, but as a social observer. Dumarang, you and do Yanada Haz, Fala do Rajri Gayalung. I Rambajibu, Brangli Boo, Megandi, Bali Williams, Inda Maradu, India Gu, Main Gu. I've just said in my Wiradjuri Aboriginal language, hello, my name is Anita Heiss. I have Wiradjuri belonging, that's where I'm from, uh, from a Rambi Aboriginal mission and Brangle Aboriginal mission, and my family are the Williamses. And I've said Indimara is a Wiradjuri phrase meaning to honour and respect, and I've paid honour and respect to the people of India and the families that I've made here in India. So thank you for having me. The, po the poems or the social observations I'm going to share were published in 2007, but many of them were written in the 1990s. Back then and today, they would be regarded as political. I just call them my social observations and they are my reality. The first one's called Proud to be Kuri. Kuri is a generic Aboriginal word, uh, word that we use, Aboriginal people use for Aboriginal people in New South Wales. I am proud to be, it's called Proud to be Kuri. I am a Wiradjuri Kuri who has survived the shameful massacres, the continued injustice and, uh, and murder of my people and the destruction of a traditional respectful way of life. I have survived the bitter battles and the spilt blood of my ancestors that proved that we too are human. You measured our skulls though to see how intelligent we were, but you ignored the fact that we invented the boomerang, the greatest aerodynamic invention ever. That's how smart we are. I'm proud to be Koorig and fight the conspiracy of ignorance. I take pride in my heritage and culture and I shun appropriating white vultures. I feel contempt for those who argue against native title legislation and those who are into racial vilification. We have survived as a strong people, defying Darwin's theory, white superiority and dominance. And while policies of protection and assimilation have been replaced with self-determination and reconciliation, you still call the shots. And now, because genocide didn't work, you use your own definitions of who we are to kill us off. You define us so that you can then define yourselves. To you, I am half cast and must prove my Aboriginality. See, you still want to control my identity, but you can't, for my spirituality is mine. And what you don't understand is that after all that has happened, we are a proud people. And that while our colour might have faded, our strength and unity never will. Thank you. This is called Making Aborigines. I was born and raised a young girl. I went to school, I played with dolls, I ate McDonald's, I spoke English, I watched Romper Room and Sesame Street. I fell, I bled, I hurt, I cried, happy, I laughed. One day you called me Abbo, Bung and Coon. You spat at me, you said I was dirty. You made me your idea of what you thought I was, what you thought an Aborigine was. Why couldn't you just let me be? I was just another little girl skipping home from school. Instead, you created me, you politicised me, you made me have to be an activist, you made me have to be vocal, you gave me the chip that you now criticise me for. My parents didn't create me, I didn't create me, you created me, you made me different and then you asked me why I was so. You said I was an abo, but I could only be half cast. To you, I'm not even a whole person. I'm not half a daughter, I'm not half a woman and I'm not half an Aborigine. Are you half cast Australian? Do you call yourself part Australian because you have mixed heritage? No, you allow yourself a whole identity. Well, guess what? So do I. I am whole. I am complete. If you are struggling with who you are, then deal with it. But don't project your own identity issues onto me. My other. 
This one's called My Other, because you always talk about the other is always the primitive people or people of colour. You are my other, but you do not steal my gaze or consume my thoughts, and I am not preoccupied with trying to understand what it's like to be you, to be white, to be the majority, to be the so-called definition of civility and how it must feel to assume the superior role. And I do not ask you what it's like to be non-Indigenous, to have the freedom to choose to be politically active or to choose to participate in the reconciliation process. I do not ask you to tell me the entire history of your society or the customs of your ancestors or why your people can't seem to agree on anything. I do not ask these questions, not only because they may make you feel uncomfortable, but because it's important for me to determine my own role, my own place in this world that we share. So I really wish you would start asking yourself the same questions you ask of me and focus on the self rather than the other. Thank you. There's a joke in Australia about, oh, not only Australia, but in North America, in Native American communities as well. And they say, what makes a typical Aboriginal family? A mother, father, four kids and an anthropologist. So this one's called Anthropology Is. Anthropology is supposed to be the study of behaviour, of social relationships, of the physical, of the social, of the cultural development of human beings. Human beings. All human beings. Not just Aborigines and other primitive societies, but all human beings. But why don't I ever meet anthropologists who study white people? Uh, and I'm going to finish uh, really quickly to. on something called Why I Write. I write to voice the words, the stories, the heartbeat of my people. I write as a role, as a responsibility, as an accountability to my people. And I write with a soul, with a passion, with the experience as one of my people. And I write because it is the only way I have a voice in your world. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sorry, Hayes. One really quickly. In another life, I write chick lit. So where Bridget Jones <laughs> meets Carrie Bradshaw meets Anita Heiss at Bondi Beach. So I just wanted to finish with an ode to all the men I've loved before. Wonderful. None of them are in the audience and none of them read my book, so that's safe. To all the men I've loved before, you're all bastards. Thank you. I think we all had time for that one. <laughs> Our next poet is Sukhita Paul Kumar, who is a poet and critic. She is an honorary fellow at the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa and a former fellow of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study in Shimla. She is also honorary faculty at the Darrell Center at Corfu. Her, book of poem, her books of poems include Dreamcatcher and Without Margins. In addition to bilingual collections, such as poems come home with translations by Gulzarji. So good. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think I'll start with the poem Dreamcatcher because that's the name of the title. That's the title of a book that I have. After which the new one is not yet released, so I will just stick to Dreamcatcher. Dreamcatcher. I must reach the forest in time before the break of dawn each day to pick some dreams scattered in misty darkness. I must reach before the sun crackles through the leaves of the trees on which dreams appear perching on the branches through the night. Dreams half dreamt, fully dreamt, and those yet to be dreamt like babies born and unborn, crying out for attention, making weird faces in sleep. I pick what gets my fancy, bits from my wrinkled past, the shadowy fragments of future, mixing in twilight droplets of dew, ready to vanish with sunrise. Each day, I come home, with a bag full of dreams that drip through the day for me and all. Each night, I wait for the new dawn. My lost diary. 
born through the marriage of darkness and silence in the guarded privacy of each night, six bumpy years lay squeezed, marked not as Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, nor as dates first, second, or third, but with scars and glints, each alphabet soaked heavy with phantoms, with angels. As I wrote in the diary, fingers twitched through the dreams of the little one by my side, words descending from the right and then left, upright with heads heavy, here and there parading emblems of virtue, sometimes of vice, uncurling emotions, grouses simmering, at war with the whole world and with self, stuck in the sticky cobwebs here, there lost in crevices, narrow passages, cracking bird eggs in their nests, words talking back, meanings crawling out, salt on old wounds, all this never in broad daylight when page by page, piece by piece, the child ripped the diary. Hours and minutes tumbled out of it in glee. Specks of time flying out of the window like pigeons in freedom, my lost diary. I will just read a couple of pieces from a series that I have, which I call We the Homeless. Some of you may have heard of that, some of them already. Never mind. This is when I worked with the homeless people for two or three years. And every day when I would come home, I would write a little piece. So it's one of those things that, you know, you want to get rid of the guilt of being a little better off, just to have the roof over your head and others not having it. So I think the guilt comes out, you sort of start writing poetry to take care of your own emotions. Sabji, said the boy from Badayu, teach me to write a letter, a letter that my old mother can read, Sabji. She never went to school. And remember, you must remember, I won't learn to write what she can't read. One day, all those stories twiddling their thumbs behind the shutters, half smiles peeping from fathomless deep eyes, will roll down the cheeks as tears, the ocean spilling its sorrow into the growing emptiness of the universe of the homeless. Dreams are to be dreamt in sleep, to die when the eyes open. Deny them, dismiss them, for the green pastures are nowhere. Dreams sink like paper boats when belief sits in them. Each day I must work, I must earn and eat just so that I go home. But that too is a dream, I confess. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sukrita. Sukrita may have to leave because she has another engagement. Uh, Moving on to Mr. Jagdish Giri, he is an assistant professor at Rajasthan University, as well as a poet and literary critic. He contributes regularly to literary journals. His published works include Mevat, and a critique of the novel Kala Pahad, and a book on the Bhakti movement called Bhakti Andolan. He has also edited volumes of Kavita Ke Rang. Jagdish Ji. Namaskar. I will read the book in that language, which language मेरी माँ बोलती है और चूंकि मैं अपनी माँ से उसी भाषा में बात करता हूँ इसलिए वो भाषा भी मेरी माँ ही है इसलिए
मैं उसी में पढ़ूंगा और राजस्थान के लोगों को सबको समझ में आएगी ऐसी उम्मीद करता हूं राजस्थानी में ही कविता पढ़ रहा हूं और पहली कविता मां रो गणित मां कदे ही नहीं गई स्कूल मां कदे ही नहीं गई स्कूल नहीं मांडियो पार्टी पर बरते सू कै ना सीखी गिनती ना पहाड़ा पर मां बता सके आख है परिवार रे टाबरारी उमर मां बता सके आख है परिवार रे टाबरारी उमर बता सके आख है ढोर डांगरा रो लोड बड़े पो मेरी उम्र बताऊं ता थका मां जोड़ लेवे है बा बहन भायारी उमर जका स्वर्गवास हो गया अड़क मौत मेरी उम्र बताऊं ता थका मां जोड़ लेवे बा बहन भायारी उमर जका स्वर्गवास हो गया अड़क मौत मां जाने कुण सी बच्छीरी नानी कुण सी गाही मां जाने कुण सी बच्छीरी नानी कुण सी गाही और कुण सी गा ब्याई है कितरा बैम और कुण सी गा मरगी ही जापे में बा बच्छी कितरा बरसरी हुईगी जकी ने पाली ही बोतली है सू प्या प्या दूध बा बच्छी कितरा बरसरी हुईगी जकी ने पाली ही बोतली है सू प्या प्या दूध मां उस्ताद है गणित्री मां उस्ताद है गणित्री पण जोड़ करता थका अमूमन पूछती रेवे ओडणिया रे पल्ले सु आंख पर जोड़ करता थका अमूमन पूछती रेवे ओडणिया रे पल्ले सु आंख मां रे गणित में आंसू एक जरूरी फार्मूलो है मां रे गणित में आंसू एक जरूरी फार्मूलो है दूसरी कविता है भाषारी मौत मती रो बजाए ने नी बता सका मेहे के वो काचो है या पाको मती रो बजाए ने नी बता सका मेहे के वो काचो है या पाको कोरो घड़ियो कच्चा गड़ा कोरो घड़ियो कड़काए ने नी बता सका मेहे के वो साबत है या राइजेडो डांगर रा दांत देख नी बता सका वारी उमर डांगर रात दांत देख नी बता सका वारी उमर छिंगास करती गा भैंस ने देख नी बता सका मेहे कबा ज्ञापन है या खाली जिनावरा री मनगत देख नी ओख सका मेहे मौसम ने जिनावरा री मनगत ओख ने नी कर सका मेहे मौसम री ओखाण मारो ओ अजान पणो मामूली नी है मारो ओ अजान पणो मामूली नी है आ मौत है हजारों पीढ़िया री और आ मौत है एक भाषारी और अगली कविता है नदी नदी ने पार कर सकता हा न्याव सु नाव से किस्ती से नदी ने पार कर सकता हा न्याव सु कातिर ने माने तेर कर नदी ने पार कर सकता हा न्याव सु कातिर ने नदी पर पुल भी बना सकता हा पण नी बन सके हो नदी में घर पण नी बन सके हो नदी में घर नी खोली जा सके ही नदी में दुकान ना करी जा सके ही नदी में खेती क्यों क्योंकि नदी री बाढ़ में डूब सकता हा घर मकान और दुकान पण किणी ने नी होयो अचुंबो पण किणी ने नी होयो अचुंबो जद बाजार री बाढ़ में डूबगी नदी पण किणी ने नी होयो अचुंबो जद बाजार री बाढ़ में डूबगी नदी नदी में घर नदी में खेत और नदी में दुकान अब नदी ने पार करी जा सके बिना नाव बिना तिरिया बिना पुल अब 
नदी ने पार करी जा सके बिना नाव बिना तिरिया बिना पुल एक छोटी कविता पढ़ देता हूं मुझे लगता है वक्त का अभाव होगा कोई बूक मांड तो यू कोई बूक मांड तो मेहतीस लख ले कोई बदर ओडो दीख तो मैं मौत पढ़ ले कदे तवो हांस तो मेह बांच ले खुशी रा समाचार कदे तवो हांस तो तवे तवा भी हंसता था रोटी बनाने के लिए तवा हंसता था आजकल नहीं हंसता है कदे तवो हांस तो मेह बांच ले खुशी रा समाचार कदे कागलो बोल तो मेह पावना रे स्वागत री तैयारी करता कदे कागलो बोल तो मेह पावना रे स्वागत री तैयारी करता भरे घड़े पणिहारी मिलती मेह भावी बांच ले भरे घड़े पणिहारी मिलती मेह भावी बांच ले टूड़ी रा इंडा और जड़ कागरी बोली सू मौसम अर्थाए ले गा भैंसिया री पुकार गोदहरी दड़ूक ऊंट री गूंज और सोन चिड़ी री उडार रा अण लिख्या शब्द भी शामिल हा मारी भाषा रे शब्द को उसमें गा भैंसिया री पुकार गोदहरी दड़ूक ऊंट री गूंज और सोन चिड़ी री उडारी रा अण लिख्या शब्द भी शामिल हा मारी भाषा रे शब्द को उसमें ओ मेरी भाषा थू राख थारा सगड़ा शब्द को ओ मेरी भाषा थू राख थारा सगड़ा शब्द को मन सूप दे फगत आ अण लिख्या शब्दा रो अर्थ मन फूप सूप दे फगत आ अण लिख्या शब्दा रो अर्थ बहुत धन्यवाद बहुत धन्यवाद जगदीश जी आर नेक्स्ट पोइट इज सलमा सलमा इज अ वेल नोन नेम टू रीडर्स ऑफ कंटेम्प्रेरी तमिल लिटरेचर शी हैज पब्लिश टू वॉल्यूम्स ऑफ पोएट्री